Funding for NJ Business Beat provided by New Jersey Chamber of Commerce, working to keep New Jersey in business. Online at njchamber.com and New Jersey Society of CPAs, committed to the integrity, objectivity, competence, and professionalism of CPAs and the quality of their services. This week, an eye-opening look at the impact of COVID from some of the people hurt the most. Business owners detail their struggles and a gloomy outlook. Plus, is your holiday shopping done yet? We'll look at ways you can rein in spending while still checking off every person on your holiday gift list. And optimism along the shore. In our deep dive, we look at the challenges for the tourism industry in the pandemic and why business leaders and lawmakers are confident in a bounce back season in 2021. That's straight ahead on NJ Business Beat. This is NJ Business Beat with Rhonda Schaffler. Hello, I'm Rhonda Schaffler. Thanks for joining us on NJ Business Beat, a new show taking a deeper look at the stories, trends, and influencers shaping New Jersey's business landscape each week. And while you're here, make sure you subscribe to our NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel to get alerted when we post new episodes and clips. We begin with a look at how badly COVID leveled the state's business community and why many business owners aren't optimistic that things will get better anytime soon. Every year, the New Jersey Business and Industry Association releases its annual Business Outlook Survey. This year's report is not pretty. I spoke with Michelle Sukurka, the president and CEO of the NJBIA, about why businesses and their employees have a lot to worry about heading into the new year. Michelle, this annual outlook survey has a lot of information. Before we pitch to the future, I want to really reflect on what these businesses told you about 2020. We knew it was devastating for so many businesses, but this survey put some numbers around the revenue story. Absolutely. I mean, three out of four businesses suffered revenue losses in, in 2020. No surprise, given um, limited capacity, business closings, you know, just the all around struggles. But um, the sad part of this, Rhonda, really is that about 50% of them tell us it's going to take them more than a year uh, just to get back to, to to equal to where they were before. That's not even, you know, that that's just making enough money in order to pay their expenses. We're not even talking about turning profit. Uh, this must be by far the most dismal survey you've done. Uh, it is since my time at NJBIA. I mean, I'm here six years and, you know, this is, uh, this is a rock bottom. I'll tell you that we see a lot of numbers starting to uh, harken back to 2008 when uh, we had a lot of pessimism about economy um, and post Superstorm Sandy 2012 going into 2013. The numbers we're seeing now this year really mirror back to those times, which we know were not good economic times for the state of New Jersey. So when businesses start looking ahead to the future, what are they saying about their big worries? Uh, well, amazingly still, you know, the thing that comes up at the top is uh, things like, you know, property tax, um, which in New Jersey for a lot of small businesses that own their property is a significant uh, bottom line cost to them. Many are concerned about their ability to continue to carry health care for their employees next year. This is a big concern. You know, one thing is when, when unemployment is up and employment numbers are, are, are kind of static, right? A concern about is what, what's the impact going to be on benefits for New Jersey employees? And I am concerned that about 28% of the 72% of those surveyed who do offer health care say they might not be able to continue those benefits next year. That's a concern. Yeah, it is. What do these companies say about their uh, workforces? Do they plan to hire? Can some of these companies um, look to hire workers that were laid off? Yeah, you know, the numbers are a bit flat. Um, we do see some companies, about 20%, saying that um, they're hoping to make new hires next year, but that's a very low number relative to where the economy was booming, you know, just a short year or two ago. Uh, interestingly, there was also some information in this survey about pay increases. Yes. Uh, so again, uh, pretty static. Um, however, there is a small, small population that says, I got to keep my, my best and my brightest. And so they're looking at increases, but the increases are small. It's like one to 2.9%. 
Uh, so even while some are looking optimistically at being able to bring more benefits to their employees, uh, it, it, it's not by big amounts. Michelle, I guess what's discouraging too for those that are fairly pessimistic about next year is that many of those surveyed, the majority took some sort of grant or loan or something to kind of weather the storm. They did, um, about 50% did. Um, but what we find is, you know, that really, it's a lifeline that carries them just from week to week. For many, it wasn't enough for them to continue on. And that's our biggest concern going forward. How do we comprehensively put together relief for businesses that keeps them being able to employ people, keep livelihoods, generate just enough money to pay their expenses, and keep their head above water. You know, that's the concern right now. Throwing them these lifelines as small grants is only biding them time. Um, and while we'll take as much of that grant money as we can, we need to be bigger thinking in how we bring relief to New Jersey businesses. Michelle, was there any particular industry that stood out as suffering more or more op optimistic than other industries? Well, I'll tell you, when it came to uh, revenue losses, unfortunately, healthcare was way up at the top, way up at the top. Transportation, um, business services, and retail, no surprise there. Uh, healthcare, we know what was driving that, uh, the inability to provide elective surgery. That went on for a long time. Um, and this is why now we talk about, as we're through this second wave, we have to be really careful. Governor, please stick with that scalpel that you keep talking about. Uh, because we cannot have an across-the-board shutdown. Michelle, I think one other interesting aspect of the survey was you did ask about marijuana uh, for the first time ever, now that we're moving toward setting up regulations in the industry. What are employers saying about that? Uh, across the board, board, employers are significantly concerned about workplace safety. Workplace safety is the number one concern when it comes to legalization of marijuana. And as we talk about this, Rhonda, we're battling, we're battling to get a, a workplace safety amendment uh, in the bill right now that is being contemplated. You know, what we say here is that we recognize and respect that the voters have said legalize marijuana, okay? And we recognize and respect people's ability to use marijuana to uh, take care of medical issues and otherwise. But when it comes to public safety in the workplace and safety sensitive positions, that has to take precedence over anyone's right to smoke pot. I know some of these employers are also concerned about more mandates and some of the familiar themes we've heard in past surveys. You pointed out that many businesses feel like they did before the Great Recession, after Sandy. Are you optimistic that a Jersey businesses have what it takes to kind of weather this storm, which is worse than those. Yeah, this is a monsoon for New Jersey business. Um, and it's just a perpetual, it's a perpetual hit. Look, you know, our business community is very resilient. We've been through a lot. We seem to be able to dust ourselves off and, and pick ourselves back up. Uh, right now, we're gonna have to be really innovative um, on how we do that. We're gonna have to look at new ways to um, distribute our products and services. Um, you know, this in-time demand and, and getting things delivered as opposed to people coming to products, right? Uh, and this is where technology is gonna have to be a huge enabler for New Jersey business. And so the more we can collectively think outside the box on how we empower companies to deliver differently than they did before is a way I think we give them a better lifeline to the other side. Michelle Sukurka, good to talk to you. Thank you so much. Anza, thank you so much. So what's the state legislature doing to try to fix the business climate? It was the topic of a discussion this week at an NJBIA public policy forum appropriately named Bringing Businesses Back in Trying and Taxing Times. Could you discuss your views of the legislature's role in handling the pandemic and the resulting economic downturn and what role do you want to play as we look beyond and think about the state's recovery? And Senate President, I'd like to start with you. With everything that you described, the fact that we're, we're in the position we're in right now, I mean, financially, we, we've taken some hits, but it could, be, it could actually have been worse. It could have been a lot worse. Now our focus is next year's budget and finding ways to uh, ensure funding, you know, schools and colleges and try to get ourselves out of this funk that we're in. And we're gonna to need to do stimulus. We're gonna to need to do a lot of infrastructure when I say stimulus, get get things moving. We, we need the Hudson Bergen light rail. We need the Gloucester Camden light rail projects to get going. Um, we need to create jobs. And that means that I, I know the speaker and I and Tom and John will be working on an incentive package that we, we really need to try to get done by the end of the year. 
While the legislature moves forward on that, Republican Assembly Leader John Bramnick urged Governor Murphy to spend more time talking to small businesses around the state. It is so frustrating for someone who owns a bar or a restaurant not to be able to talk to anyone uh, high up in the administration. He needs to have an open discussion with these people. That's not saying his decisions are wrong per se. We just need some more openness other than executive orders for businesses in the state. And I agree the federal government's got to come through with money because all due respect to the state of New Jersey, we don't have enough money to fix this problem. We should absolutely have a special session. We should take CARES money. It's not committed and spend it, but we're going to need federal help. No question about it. Well, on the topic of more federal help from Washington, here we go again. There's a new $908 billion proposal on the table put forth by a bipartisan group of lawmakers, including New Jersey Congressman Josh Gottheimer. We can't allow some to prioritize politics ahead of the pandemic. This four-month COVID-19 emergency relief package will help get us through the hardest months of winter and into a new administration. It's an essential down payment in what our families, small businesses, and local communities need. This package includes more help for businesses, money for state and local governments, and supplemental uninsurance benefits. That's desperately needed in New Jersey. The state labor department says unemployment benefits made available through the CARES Act are set to expire on December 26th. In New Jersey, 487,000 unemployed workers are currently receiving those federal benefits, so their financial futures are at risk. On top of that, job growth is slowing, according to this week's report from New Jersey-based ADP, which showed companies created 307,000 new jobs in November. Rutgers professor Bill Rogers, who serves as the chief economist at the Heldrich Center for Workforce Development, put that number into perspective. The operative word is growth. Uh, that's the good news. Uh, but the uh, challenging news is that uh, we are seeing a slowdown uh, over the last few months uh, at the national level. Uh, Non-farm payrolls have been uh, trending downward a little bit, uh, a little deceleration. And the ADP report uh, uh, issued yesterday um, confirmed that. But the economy still does have a lot of uh, long distance to go. And we're facing some major headwinds. Despite concerns about the economy, we're still spending a lot of money shopping. Cyber Monday sales hit an all-time record this week, $10.8 billion. Keep in mind, the online buying binge comes as other data shows there's clearly been a shift to shopping online from shopping in stores. The holidays are a tricky time for anyone on a budget. I talked with Aurora Rosado Lazaro, a partner with the accounting firm Sobel Co., to get some tips on how to avoid overspending. Aurora, this time of year is so hard for so many people who are just trying to manage their finances. It seems that typically a lot of us start to overspend. Uh, first of all, in your practice, how common is it where you see people who kind of um, fall into a little bit of debt this time of year? So I think it, it it really depends, and I think it depends on the kind of person. And I think that you have some clients who, yes, they spend more freely, but then you have other clients who are managing to a budget. You have some clients who do their personal finances in QuickBooks, you know, because they want to be so organized. So it, it really it really depends on on the client. So for those who perhaps are not as organized, uh, what sort of advice do you have for people to try to avoid overspending during this holiday shopping period? So there's a few things that, that I do personally that I think helps me. And one of them is I create an Amazon wish list for myself and for my daughter. And as the year's going along, I keep adding things to the list and taking things off the list. And that way I'm not just, you know, it's so easy to go on your phone and go onto Amazon and put something in your cart and buy it right away. And I find if I put it in there and then some time goes on, sometimes I don't really need it. And it just goes away. So I think not controlling yourself and not spending things so freely is helpful. I also think at this time of year, it's really easy to fall into the trap where you see a new cell phone came out and all this new technology came out. And what I try to do for myself, again, is I usually research new technology when it comes out 
and I'll go look at CNET videos to see what the reviews are. I'll go and look at, you know, YouTube reviews and see, because, you know, a cell phone, for example, if the, if it's going to keep getting updated for another year with, you know, software updates, you really don't need the newest and greatest model. I actually have what I call my closet of gifts. And so throughout the year, and I, I try to time it, like if it's the end of the summer or after Christmas, when there's certain sales and things like that, I might buy things and then I'm just going to save it, you know, for the next year. So I'm not buying things. I think when you go out to buy something at the last minute, you end up spending so much more than if you would have planned for what you're going to buy. You know, I usually set myself budgets. You know, I have a lot of, there's a lot of kids in the family. So if I'm going to buy things for everyone, I kind of set a budget for each person. And I know I'm not going to go over that. How do you handle kind of the, um, you know, it's been a rough year. We're still in a pandemic. I'm feeling bad about where I am and about myself. And I just want to buy something to make me feel better. What advice do you have for those kind of people? So I would say if, if there's something that's going to make your life easier, then I think sometimes you can make an investment like that. But I think you have to be smart about it. You know, like if you need a new computer because, you know, you, you need to do video calls and now we've switched to this virtual environment and you need to make sure you have a webcam that works and a microphone that works, then I think that's something that you're investing in for yourself, but you're also investing in because it's going to make you more productive in this new environment that we're part of. So I think it's, it's you know, it's okay to buy things if they make you feel you know, better, but I think it also goes to, you know, do you need those things? And I think it, it can't just be like, you're just spending to spend. I think it's got to be like, if you can, if you have a need for it and it serves a purpose, you're not going to feel that guilt afterwards. You're not going to have the buyer's remorse. What advice do you have for people who don't follow the advice that you just gave that, you know, January comes around and you start to see some bills if you bought on credit? Um, is there any kind of practical mindset to get into to get out of that debt? So I would say that, you know, you need to almost like set yourself a budget and not spend more than that. And because you know, when the new year comes, you're going to have those bills. And I'm sure for some people, it's a continuous cycle and it's something that they're dealing with on a regular basis. And I think if you set aside a certain amount of money for spending every month, it's a way to kind of control that so that it doesn't get out of hand. You know, like if you have your money for your bills, if you have money that goes for an education fund for your child or anything like that, just set a budget up every month. Because I think unless you can return things, you know, I think you're just going to keep putting yourself into the same place. I guess when we're talking about spending, I just want to take a moment to talk about giving because at least if you have some charitable deductions that you make this holiday season, which a lot of people do, they give to charities, you do get a tax break, do you not? In terms of what we saw out of Washington this year, you get a little bit of help on your taxes for next year? Yeah, if you itemize, you do get the deduction for the charitable contributions. I think it's interesting that a lot of the nonprofits are kind of. Um, going moving towards digital experiences so you can almost gift someone if you wanted to a digital experience and then you're also going to get the benefit of donating to a nonprofit sounds good all right thank you so much thank you so much take care Atlantic City received a gift of sorts this week from the credit ratings agency Moody's the agency changed its outlook for the city from stable to positive, saying that Atlantic City is making strides in improving its governance and finances. Moody says Atlantic City has been able to make financial progress, even as the casino industry has been negatively impacted by the pandemic. In our deep dive this week, we'll look at when and how tourism will rebound in New Jersey. In most years, tourism is a major economic driver for our state. In 2019, a record-breaking 116 million visitors came to New Jersey and they spent more than $46 billion, generating billions in tax revenue for the state and local governments. 
But then COVID hit and it hit the industry hard, according to Adam Pearl, the president of the New Jersey Tourism Industry Association. The economic impact has been immense and it has been larger to the travel and tourism industry than any other sector in New Jersey. We know as of the end of October that one in four jobs uh, remain unemployed within the sector and that one third of all job loss in New Jersey was part of the leisure and travel sector. Since tourism is such an important part of New Jersey's economy and responsible for so many jobs, is there anything the state can do to speed up the recovery? I talked to Senator Declan O'Scanlan about what the legislature has in mind. Is there anything the state legislature can do? Is there any additional funding that might be possible or changing regulations or something that might help encourage um, tourism to return? You, you've hit on a couple things. First off, the legislature should have been included months ago. I get when we were out of the gate, March, April, May, uh, that, that everybody's bandwidth was, was completely uh, blasted. Uh, but since then, uh, the governor's office should have included the legislature, more members of the legislature. The legislature, from a formal standpoint, uh, should have been in the loop. Uh, there's some good ideas. There's some smart people here. You can take me off the list, even if you want, but there's other smart people here that, uh, that should be at that table. Uh, I know for a fact, because I've spoken to a lot of them, a lot of frustration out there, and a lot of wealth of knowledge uh, of the local market, of the uh, local businesses. We should have been at the table. Uh, as far as funding goes, you sort of, it's, it's, it's a twofer. The legislature has put forward a number of bills that would provide more aid to our small businesses in particular, restaurants, et cetera, and the governor's vetoed them. Uh, we do have money. Uh, we've gotten out now, substantial amount of the CARES Act money, although I'm not sure it's in people's hands, but it certainly is into department hands. Um, but we also have a, a massive surplus growing every day, some of which could easily be easily uh, be devoted to saving some of these businesses. Uh, we should be doing more of that. I have a bill right now that we're in, encouraging be included into uh, our reenactment of, of the EDA uh, so that we, we not just protect and encourage and, and attract larger businesses, but we save our smaller ones at the same time. I've got a bill literally working on it, uh, put, getting moving it now uh, today and have been for weeks. And then we need to be prepared. The legislature needs to be prepared if the governor won't uh, work with us to override. Uh, we got to get some backbone and step up uh, and look and work with the administration where we can. Uh, very good friends, governor being one of them. Uh, but we all need to work together, hear all these ideas and be responsive to each other. Senator, what about the idea, you know, once we get past this and to your point, hopefully vaccines come along and things are a lot better. Are there tax incentives or something we can do to maybe encourage new small businesses to try to open up a place on the boardwalk um, and, and find opportunity in this mess? Well, th there are. And we, I think we are going to move uh, uh, new EDA, Economic Development Authority legislation, um, I, very soon. And I'm hopeful that, that small business incentives will be part of that. Uh, we need to look at regulations and red tape and encourage municipalities. They all, we all really, really uh, did a great job this past spring and summer of, of getting through regulations and red tape and permitting people, certainly with outdoor dining. Uh, we moved with lightning speed. Uh, the, the ABC, Alcoholic Beverage Commission, moved with lightning speed to make it easier on folks to expand, to get creative, to sell cocktails to go. It all worked. There was no downside to any of it. We should keep all of that. It should never go away. If we have regulations for regulation's sake, uh, we shouldn't have them. Uh, so we need to do all of those things and then listen to businesses as well. Now, uh, the flip side of some of these businesses closing means there's going to be vacancies. There's going to be probably folks wanting to get in there. Now, my heart breaks for the folks uh, that didn't make it, who maybe lost their life savings. And we have to do all we can to have as few of these vacancies as possible. But there will be some. And for folks wanting to get into these facilities uh, and, and start new businesses, got to do all we can to cut red tape uh, and to permit them to move forward. If there's a slight change in use, uh, having someone go for a variance or so, stop. Uh, let's cut through that and enable as many businesses to be open, creating as much economic activity and generating as many jobs as possible. 
and God willing, we, we should be in a good place come June uh, to roar back uh, next summer. That needs to be our goal. And we can't let government be in the way of that. Not only that, we need to have government be part of a constructive uh, uh, turbocharging of exactly that. Senator, good to catch up with you again. Thank you. Thanks for having me. At the New Jersey Conference on Tourism held this week, experts said they don't see the travel and tourism industry fully recovering until 2023, but they do expect New Jersey will bounce back faster than that. Governor Murphy explained why he's optimistic about next summer season. While the updates on the developing COVID-19 vaccines are incredibly positive and exciting, our tourism industry will not be dependent on the success of a vaccine. In fact, we know that many people may still be reluctant to go to the airport and get on a plane for many months to come. But unlike so many other vacation destinations, New Jersey is not dependent on visitors who need to travel by plane. This means that we are uniquely positioned to capture an even greater number of visitors who, like this past summer, are choosing to vacation more locally. That's something Cape May County Tourism Director Diane Wieland is already seeing, and Cape May is upping its efforts to attract more local visitors. September, we actually generated more in occupancy tax in 2020, September 2020, than in September 2019. So kind of a, a surprise for all of us, uh, you know, exceeded our expectations, but we knew just by the, you know, the number of people in the area, uh, anecdotal reports from our businesses that the fall is very strong. And we're finding that uh, rentals, some of our real estate offices are reporting double and triple the number of rentals, weekly rentals in um, September, October through November. Uh, and some are even saying into January. However, uh, as I take the numbers down through, through September, we are still off about 24% uh, compared to last year. So, uh, you know, I'd look at, you know, one out of every $4 uh, so far has been lost to COVID uh, for our businesses. And those businesses that have been most impacted um, are our restaurants, the food and beverage industry. Meantime, if you love the Jersey Shore like I do and typically rent a house for a week or two each summer, the best advice is don't wait to book for next summer. The shore is still hopping, even in the off season, according to Matthew Kasha of Glen Mary Real Estate in Point Pleasant Beach. Matt, many of us are eagerly looking forward to 2021 already. And obviously our tourism situation was unique in 2020 and potentially could improve next year, I'm thinking that is uh, likely. Are you seeing that kind of early sense that we could have a decent summer next year? I really, I really think so, Rhonda. Uh, I know a lot of people are uh, excited about next year and there's been a lot of activity, especially in the real estate market at the Jersey Shore. A lot of people are moving um, from certain areas. I mean, mainly I'm seeing a lot from the smaller cities, uh, well, bigger cities, but smaller living situations like Manhattan, for example, and people are leaving there, leaving their six, 700 square foot apartment, uh, paying a lot of money in rent and moving to a bigger area, places like the Jersey Shore, and they're paying less rent. Uh, they have access to more essential items, um, for example, supermarkets, um, so um, I do think that uh, this kind of uh, rush to the Jersey Shore that we've seen in the real estate market will re really uh, help uh, the local economies, uh, the restaurants, um, the beaches. Uh, so I, I am uh, expecting a big year in 2021. What about rentals? It seemed that this past summer turned out to be better than expected. Are people already um, thinking about their shore houses for next year? They are. I mean, believe it or not, uh, already we're getting calls, uh, even starting back in October, people calling about next summer, looking already for renting out a whole month of next summer. So uh, I do think that um, there will be a lot of activity next year, the Jersey Shore and at the beaches and the boardwalks. So um, I think people want an escape. And I feel like um, 
you know, the Jersey Shore for a lot of people, a lot of times they're getting people from uh, local areas. So it is an escape, but it's also not too far. You can jump in your car and uh, get there for most people in an hour, hour and a half. Is the way the rental market uh, is shaping up, is it changing at all? For instance, you mentioned people renting places for a month. Are you seeing more longer term rentals? Is it harder to get a place, say, for four or five days? Tell us how the dynamics are changing a little bit beyond early phone calls in the fall. Yeah, sure. So normally, I mean, at the shore, the bigger uh, rental market obviously is the summer. Uh, most people will either rent out for maybe one week or some rent out for one month or the whole summer. Uh, now I'm seeing actually a lot more people calling up for winter rentals. They started calling in October and they want to live there from October uh, all the way through May. Um, that's a little bit kind of unusual. I uh, usually don't see a lot of winter rentals, but I think people um, are working from home now. So instead of living in a smaller apartment, they'd rather live in a big house with uh, more amenities. So um, that is a little bit different than uh, what we've seen in the past, I would say. Uh, Matt, there are certain parts of the Jersey Shore where if you call too late, you simply, you miss out on a house for the summer. I mean, the places are gone with the number of bedrooms you need, et cetera. Uh, is it gonna be the same kind of situation this year where people are going to have to move quickly if they're thinking ahead to the summer? Yes, uh, I think uh, I would say if, if I wanted to run the place for the summer or a specific week, especially, uh, I would start calling now, uh, December, January. I mean, come February or March, I think that'd be too late, especially if you want a specific time or a specific weekend. Do you expect that landlords are going to be able to ask uh, higher rents then? I do think they'll be able to ask uh, higher, I mean, higher rents. I mean, just naturally uh, the low supply and demand. But also, you know, some of the things, if you're going back to landlords, one of the things that they're concerned about is people from the winter rentals not leaving come summertime. And obviously during the winter time, the rents are a lot cheaper uh, than some of the rents that uh, they get in the summer, whether they be the whole summer or per week. The one final question I have is, I think we're having this conversation with the assumption that the worst is over for COVID-19. If the second wave turns into something worse, are all bets off? You know, uh, like, like we, we said earlier, I mean, uh, last year, the rental market come July or August was very, very, very uh, popular down the shore. So I think even if we do have a second wave, things will be a little bit slower, but I would not say all bets are off. I mean, people stu still want to be by the beach. They want to be by the boardwalk. Like I said earlier, they want to be uh, around uh, restaurants, supermarkets, and just have more space. And for a lot of those people uh, that are coming from these smaller apartments, small living, small living situation, situations, uh, they're still going to want to come down to the Jersey Shore this summer. Matt, thank you. Sure, you're welcome. Thank you so much. And thank you for watching NJ Business Beat. Make sure you subscribe to our NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel and you'll get an alert when we post a new episode or clip. And are you a business interested in sponsoring NJ Business Beat? Contact Steve Priolo at the email or phone number you see at the bottom of your screen. I'm Rhonda Schapler. See you next week. Funding for NJ Business Beat provided by New Jersey Chamber of Commerce, working to keep New Jersey in business, online at njchamber.com, and New Jersey Society of CPAs, committed to the integrity, objectivity, competence, and professionalism of CPAs and the quality of their services.